The easiest way to think about behavioural economics is to think about what it's not. Classical economic theory holds that people are entirely rational and that they always make decisions and judgments based on an almost cost-benefit analysis. In other words, you, people deliberate, they weigh up all the possible variables, um, they consider how they're going to maximise their benefit and minimise the cost. So that's what classical economic theory is about. Behavioural economics challenges that view based on decades of psychological experimentation, which challenges it, says that human beings are wired to be biased in the way that they think and make decisions. It's almost like we've all got cognitive biases, they call them. So we make less than perfect decisions. And it doesn't really matter sometimes because less than perfect decisions work. They help us function in the world. But sometimes they do lead us astray. And that's kind of what behavioural economics is all about, how we can get led astray, how we may seem illogical to someone else, how we may seem irrational or unpredictable. But to ourselves, we're entirely predictable and rational and organised. So that's kind of where it sits. I think behavioural economics has come to the forefront of people's minds because from 2002, when an economist called Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for Economics, he was the first behavioural economist, and he described some of these cognitive biases, these distorted ways of thinking that we all have. And as a result of his work, many different people started to write popular books. Nudge, Predictably Irrational, Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, John Kay wrote a book called Obliquity, Influence, Mark Earls has written Herd, which is about herd behaviour. And there's just been this plethora of articles, new books, and a huge interest from governments, both in the States and in the UK, because one of the applications of behavioural economics is not only just understand behaviour, but how to change behaviour. So governments who are involved in public policy, like how to get people to eat more healthily, how to pe stop people smoking, all sorts of things like that, are absolutely ripe for behavioural economic principles and thinking. It's become popular because what it focuses on is behaviour, human beings' behaviour. And it's not about what people say they're going to do in the future or what their memories are about what they might have done in the past, which are often reconstructed anyway and not truthful. It's about actual behaviour. And that's what so many organisations, whether they're government or, or, or businesses, are trying to do is to figure out how to change people's behaviour. I think we do have to let go of the idea that um, attitude, opinion, beliefs precede behaviour. Because a lot of the evidence suggests it's the other way around, that if you change your behaviour, for example, if you lose weight, you continue to eat more healthily than getting your head into losing weight in the first place and then deciding to go on a diet. Many other examples of where behaviour leads attitude rather than attitude preceding behaviour. If you watch the royal wedding and I ask you why, you might say, well... It only happens every couple of decades, or I was interested to see what she looked like, whatever. The reality probably is that there was a far more emotional reason, and also a social reason, because everybody else was. And you're much more likely to be unaware of the fact that what other people do around you, and how they behave, has often far more influence on you than your beliefs about your own intrinsic decision-making, which is individual. I think the big challenge for marketers is somehow letting go of their control model. I always think that many organisations are a bit like Fortress brand. They have these huge walls and behind which you know, they, they kind of plot and scheme and aim at individual consumers with their sort of you know, best archers, you know, trying to target them so that, you know, they will, human beings will do what they want them to do. 
And I think it's a, a sort of a letting go somehow of that power that an organization can influence people's minds in a way that they'll change. So I think that what it boils down to is that they have to understand how people make judgments and decisions and then work with the grain of how people make judgments and decisions rather than trying to say, oh, we can't deal with that, so we're going to do it our way. One of the principles of behavioural economics is that human beings will not make much effort to do things. So the easier you can make something, the more they like it. For example, default choices, um, which you see all the time. You go on the internet and it makes the process with as few clicks and windows as possible and you'll do it. Whereas if you have to spend time and fill in forms and the thing doesn't work properly and you lose one window and one window comes up here, you give up, you know, after maybe, what, five, six seconds? So, you know, we fundamentally will do things um, when they're easy to do. And I think retailers have understood that. So when they queues a checkout, you know, Tesco decided to say only one in front of you or something and open more checkouts or, you know, that sort of thing. That's what I mean by making things easy. And that's, that's one of the sort of fundamental principles. <laughs> one of the other behavioural economic concepts that I like is called the curse of knowledge, which means that if you're an organisation or an individual, you assume that other people have the same knowledge as you have. So an organisation will assume that its customers or potential customers will know something about it because they know all about themselves. You know, and that's, that's one of the sort of fundamental mismatches between organisations or businesses or marketers and, and customers. The reason I think that we at Acacia are, are interested in this, and, and me personally, is that throughout my career I have always understood that human beings don't say what they think, do what they say, and sometimes even believe what they do or don't do. And I started off working for someone who was psychoanalytically trained, Bill Schlafman. For him, understanding human beings was about understanding their deeper motivations, often of which they were not conscious. So he you know, developed many of the projective techniques that we use today to try and get underneath consciousness, the cognitive consciousness that behavioural economics talk about. You know, a little bit later there was the growing understanding from neuroscience. And neuroscientists have proved beyond any doubt that human beings make decisions, primarily emotionally, that many decisions, and most of what we do in fact, is um, underneath conscious radar, otherwise, you know, the way we walk, the way we eat, where we go, what we do. If we had to consciously think of everything that we do every minute or second, we, we wouldn't even be able to get out of bed. So, you know, there was further evidence, if you like, from my experience of, of, of research and talking to hundreds and hundreds of people, whether in groups or individually or however, that people don't have access to some of the reasons why they do some things. With the best will in the world, they will try and explain but they don't really know. And essentially, we're incredibly poor witnesses to our own motivations. So the reason that I'm involved in it is because it seems to me the easiest way to explain to clients and organisations why it is that human beings behave the way they do. For me, I think the future of research is about qualitative researchers being able to deal with very complex quantitative data as well. Mark Earls and, and John Kieran did this great paper where they showed purely from Google Analytics that the fear of swine flu was a mental and emotional thing rather than a reality. And what they did was they got information about how many people were actually hospitalised um, with swine flu on an ongoing daily, weekly basis. And then they were able to find out how many people went online to get information about the swine flu and, and what to do and what the symptoms were. And, you know, the graph of real behaviour was like this. And the graph of anxiety, if you like, was huge. So they were able to show quite neatly that actually it was much more a hyped 
social effect than it was a real individual response to an illness. Um, and, and that's, I think, is a great example of how we're going to have to use um, much more sort of complicated data and learn to work with that first and then use qualitative methods to maybe bring it to life, maybe to, to bring some of the um, behavioural economic understanding of cognitive biases, you know, into it or become more useful to clients in terms of how we can point them to towards helping people change behaviour, not just diagnostically, this is what they're doing, and, and, and possibly, right, that's your problem, you go and sort it out. You know? that's, I think, where research is often stuck. I don't think behavioural economics is the silver bullet, but it has applications in particular areas and for particular projects that, that many of us get involved with. And I think there, there's sort of two areas. One is an area where we ask to help around the assessment of risk or how people make judgments about a future possibility. But if you use the lens of uh, behavioural economics to talk to people about pensions, um, you would realise that anything that they said or they claim to do in the future, you can't really be sure that they would do that. They might say they're going to take out a pension, they're seriously thinking about it, they've been recruited to participate in the research because they're really, really keen on pensions. The reality is that they might not do it for an ever-moving horizon. The lens of behavioural economics would give you a number of concepts that you would start to hear when you talked about them. And one is the power of now, which means that we always, as human beings, much more likely to want instant gratification than we are about some sort of future benefit. So um, if you're going to ask me to pay £30 a month now um, for some gain when I'm 75, it's going to feel like a loss, right? Because I need, I need my money now. So that's sort of one lens is understanding the sort of how important not to feel loss immediately is. Another concept might be to think about heuristics, which are the kind of shortcuts, rules of thumb that we use when we're making decisions. There are many, many in behavioural economics. One of them is called hindsight heuristic, which means that you assess the likelihood of something happening by the degree to which it's happened in the past. So you might have had a pension contribution in the past and it might have not done very much, in which case you're very unlikely to ever want to do one again. Another heuristic is a recency heuristic, which means that you tend to remember vivid examples that may, other people may have told you. So if somebody's had a bad experience with a pension provider or a pension, you might think that, well, I'm not going to do that because the vivid negative experience comes up in your mind and that immediately decides you against it. Lots and lots of heuristics which lead us often to make decisions very quickly. Sometimes they're effective but sometimes they're detrimental to our long-term well-being. I think one of the fundamental principles of behavioural economics is that people make decisions comparatively, not absolutely, and also relatively. So they're always making a decision or a choice relative to something else or in comparison to something else, not in absolute ways. So what that means is that you have to understand the context, their context in which they're making that decision or displaying the behaviour. So apart from the question why, which they're not aware of, you can ask, what exactly did you do? Where were you? What was it like there? who was with you or who else was doing this, how, so understanding the, the sort of steps, you know, the effort that they might have had to do or the lack of effort. And so by building an understanding of the context, you can truly understand better why they might have made the decision that they did without having to ask them directly. Another area in which behavioural economics is really useful is in terms of 
how people make choices, how, how they decide that they prefer X rather than Z, Y or Q. Um, and again, there are a number of different concepts or principles that are really helpful. Mental accounting is one. When one's talking to people about the money they have either to save or to invest or something, they have mental piggy banks, all of which have got money, which should, if you were a classical economist, be equal, right, in value, that this money and that thing should be equal to this one. But in fact, people attribute different emotions to their different little piggy banks, mental piggy banks. So one little piggy bank can be, um, this is for my child, every year uh, we put away 150 pounds and by the time they 21, they're going to have sufficient money to be able to take a gap year or whatever. I'll never touch that. Okay? This money is an inheritance I got from my mom. And actually, you know what? It's just for me. And I'm thinking that actually I'm going to splash it on a holiday this year because she would have loved that. This money um, is actually set aside for a deposit for a house because we want to buy a house and so I'm saving very carefully on that money and I, I wouldn't like to touch that. That one I sort of keep there. And then I've got a little pocket of money here that I get from work and, you know, part-time job that I've got and, um, you know, that I just use for gifts for my kids and maybe I'll have a, a, a punt on the, on the horses or do the lottery, right? So that's an example of how people make decisions because in each of those cases, with each of those pots of money, the decision is different about you know, what you might prefer to do with it. That's an example called mental counting. Um, the other one is choice architecture, which you find time and time again. And you give people four or five alternatives to choose from, whether by size or quantity or, or something. They'll tend to go, they avoid the extremes, they go for somewhere in the middle. So if you alter the, the, the sizes of those, you sell more or people eat more. There's no such thing as a neutral choice. Um, and you know, restaurants know this because with wine menus, for example, they know that people avoid the wines at the top, the most expensive. They'll also avoid the wines at the bottom, the cheapest. Um, either because they don't want to be um, thought to be mean or because they really think they're rubbish. So they choose either four or fifth from the top or four or fifth from the bottom. And restaurateurs put the wines that they make the most profit on in those two positions. So again, you know, the way a wine list is presented can, uh, can affect the choices that you make. I don't know who's actually doing it. I know we at Akesh Avenue are doing it. And we, we are doing it in different ways. In, in, in one way, we're using it as an analytical tool, as a way of listening to potential consumers or customers, how they, they talk about their behavior. And another is um, by actually working with particular clients on problems which suit it. And more and more clients are beginning to think that maybe there is something in this. So they're willing to experiment, sometimes with methodologies, sometimes in, you know, just tighter, more behaviorally focused um, research rather than, you know, this kind of very, I don't know, broad reaching diagnostic sort of thing. So we're committed to exploring it.